All right, hey guys, Justin, thanks for the reminder. I was helping a lot of people with Zoom and whatnot today, so thank you, you're right. I wanna to read today, Thursday, those two days I'm not going Zoom live. That's the best days, I think, for me to do it and try to do it Friday as well. So I'll post it. Here we go. We're on chapter 10, okay, of Sign of the Beaver. All right. If I recall last time... Um, um, Etienne, At Etienne, uh, quickly left and was upset because uh, Matt was reading in Robinson Crusoe about slavery, and he was not happy with that. So here we go. Chapter ten is uh, a longer one, but not too long. Here we go. He felt weak with relief when next morning Etienne walked stiffly into the cabin and sat down at the table. Stiffly. Kind of kind of makes me think he was forced to do it, right? Like, Ugh. Stumbling over himself, he set about the lesson. As soon as he could, he picked up Robinson Crusoe. In the night, he had carefully thought out just what he was going to say if Atien ever gave him another chance. Now he had to talk fast because he could see that Atien was set against hearing any more of this book. Let me go on, he pleaded. It's different from now on. Friday, that's what Robinson Crusoe named him, doesn't kneel anymore. Not slave? No, Matt lied. After that, they get to be, well, companions. They share everything together. Ignoring the suspicion on Atien's face, Matt hurriedly uh, began hurriedly to read. He was thankful that he knew the book so well that he was able to see when trouble might be coming. So he could skip words, right? One of the first words Crusoe taught his man Friday was the word master. Luckily, he caught that one in time. And it was true, Crusoe and his new companion did go about together, sharing their adventures. Only, Matt thought, it would have been better, perhaps, if Friday hadn't been quite so thick-headed. After all, there must have been a thing or two about that desert island that a native who had lived there all his life could have taught Robinson Crusoe. When Matt closed the book, Etienne nodded. Then, as so many times before, he took Matt by surprise. You like go fish? He asked. Oh, I sure would, Matt said gratefully. Stopping to pick up his fish pole from beside the door, he ran to overtake the Indian boy who strode ahead. He knew his grin was stretching from one ear to the other, but he couldn't hide his feelings as Etienne did. They walked some distance. Matt, managing to keep pace with the Indian's swift stride, determined not to let Atien know that his angle, ankle was aching. They seemed to be following no particular trail. Finally, they came out on a part of the creek that Matt had not seen before. It was shallow here, studded with rocks and pebbles, so that the water rippling over them made little rapids or collected in quiet pools. Here, Atien stopped, broke off a sapling, and instead of making a fish pole, drew his knife from his pouch and quickly shaved a sharp point, making a spear. Then he stepped gently into the stream. Matt stood watching. Atien stood motionless, peering intently into a pool of clear water. All at once he stooped, darted his steer with one his spear, sorry, darted his spear with one quick stroke and came up with a glittering fish. He studied it for a moment. Too small, he decided. To Matt's astonishment, he spoke to the fish quite solemnly. So seriously, right? A few incomprehensible words and then tossed it back into the stream. In a few moments, he had speared another, which he judged large enough to keep. Do same, he ordered now, coming back to the bank. He handed Matt the spear. He would just look ridiculous, Matt knew before he started. He waded in and stood up to his knees, looking down into the sliding water. Presently, a fish darted past. At least he thought it was a fish. It was hard to tell which was shadow and which might be a fish. At any rate, he was gone before he got his spear into the water. <coughs> Presently, he saw another, this one quite definitely a fish, calmly drifting in the pool. He jabbed at it hopelessly. He was sure his stick actually touched the slippery thing. 
He lunged at it, lost his footing, and went down with a splash that would scare off any fish for miles around. Pfft. When he came up dripping, he saw Atian watching him with a horrid grin. <sighs> Suddenly he felt hot in spite of the icy water. Why had Atian brought him out here anyway? Did Atian just want to show off his own cleverness and to make Matt look more clumsy than ever? Was this Atian's answer in case Matt had any idea in his head about being a Robinson Crusoe, meaning being Atian's master? For a moment, Matt glared back at Atian with a scowl as black as any Indian's. Then he wiped his nose with the back of his hand and sloshed back to the bank. He snatched up his own pole and line. He poked about under the wet leaves and found a good juicy worm and fitted it to his hook. I'll do it my own way, he said. I can catch plenty of fish with this, and that's what matters. Etienne sat on the bank and watched. To Matt's satisfaction, in no time, there was a tug on the line, a strong one. An impressive-looking fish rose to the surface, thrashing fiercely. Matt gave a jerk, and the line came swinging out of the water so suddenly that he almost lost his footing again. It was empty. Fish broke line, Atien observed. As if anyone couldn't see that. Furious at Atien, at the fish, and at himself, Matt examined the break, unable to face the Indian. He had lost more than a good fish. His hook had disappeared as well. The only hook he had. Of course, Atien noticed. Those black eyes never missed anything. Make new hook, he suggested. Without even getting to his feet, he reached out and broke a twig off a maple sapling. Out came the crooked knife again. In a few strokes, he had cut a piece as long as his little finger, carved a groove around the middle, and whittled both ends into sharp points. Now he stepped into the water and tied Matt's line expertly around the groove. Put on two worms, he said. Cover up all hook. He didn't offer to find the worms. Matt had lost all interest in fishing. He knew that somehow or other he would just provide more amusement for Atien, but he couldn't refuse. He didn't have to wait long before another fish caught hold. This time he landed neatly. Good, said Atien from the bank. Big. Matt was trying to get it off the line. He swallowed the whole hook, he said. Better white man's hook, Etienne said. Turn around and side fish, not get away. Back on the bank, Matt slit the fish and extracted the hook and his line, but the thin twig had broken in half. Easy make a new hook, Etienne said. Make many hooks, of course. Looking down at the simple thing in his hand, Matt realized that he never again need worry about losing a hook. He could make a new one wherever he happened to be. It was another necessary thing that Atien had shown him, just as he had made the snare. He wasn't sure why Atien had bothered, but grudgingly he had to admit that Atien had proved to him once again that he didn't always have to depend on white man's tools. All at once he was hungry. The sun was straight overhead, and it would be a long tramp back through the woods before he could cook his fish. Now he saw that Atien had the same thought. The Indian was heaping up a small pile of pine needles and grass. He drew from his muskrat skin pouch a piece of hard stone with bits of quartz embedded in it. Quartz like rock. Striking with his knife, he soon had a spark, which he blew into a flame. I could have done that myself, Matt thought. In fact, he had done it many a time, but he had not realized that he could use a common stone as well as his flint. Get fish ready, Etienne ordered now, pointing to the two fish on the bank. Matt did not like his masterful tone, but he did as he was told. By the time he had the two fish split and gutted and washed in the creek, Etienne had a fire blazing. Matt was curious to see how he would go about the cooking. He watched. As Etienne cut two short branches bending them first to make sure they were green. Oh, okay. He trimmed and sharpened them rapidly. Then he thrust a point in each... Then he thrust a pointed end into each fish from head to tail. A small green stick was set crosswise inside the fish to hold the sides apart. He handed one stick to Matt. One on each side of the fire, the two boys squatted and held their sticks to the blaze. 
From time to time, Etienne fed the fire with dry twigs. When the flesh was crisp and brown, they ate, still silently. Matt licked his fingers. His resentment had vanished along with his hunger. Golly, he said, that was the best fish I ever ate. Good, said Etienne. Across the fire, he was looking at Matt, and his eyes gleamed. He was laughing again, but somehow not with scorn. What do you say to that fish you threw back? Matt was still curious. I say to him not to tell other fish, Etienne said seriously. Not scare away. You actually think a fish could understand? Etienne shrugged. Fish know many things, he replied. Matt sat pondering the strange idea. Well, it seemed to work, he said finally. At least the other fish came along. A wide grin spread slowly across Etienne's face. It was the first time Matt had seen him smile. So it sounds like he was starting to get along, right? His friends even, maybe. Etienne showed him a couple of really good things. And, and good thing, because Matt lost his hook. And without that, he wouldn't be able to fish. And now he knows how to make more hooks. Chapter 11 is for next time, planning on Thursday. All right, I'm going to upload this. Enjoy your leisure, guys, okay? Thanks. Have a great day. Hopefully everything is going well. My apologies for the technical glitch. It seems we might be having for some students putting their documents into the new folder. We'll get it worked out. Meanwhile, share the document with me, okay? All right. It'll take me a little longer now to get back to people, um, feedback, who did not successfully get it in the folder, but by tomorrow we should be good. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.